so uh, welcome to the last lecture lecture number 21 of this course so this is where we had stopped last time galaxy formation and evolution can be thought of as a fast process or a slow process or it can be thought of as a process that is uh, internal uh, to the galaxy or is influenced by external factors so these of course these two axes are orthogonal they're not related to each other but in in each case you get different kinds of uh, scenarios so for example if you have a fast uh, and process which is not related to interactions with other uh, galaxies you get what is called the protogalactic uh, collapse so this was the sort of formation that was envisaged by the uh, model of uh, again the ELS 1962 paper Uh, again, Lyndon Bell and Sandage, wherein they thought of uh, a giant gas cloud collapsing under very rapidly under its own gravity and fragmenting uh, into smaller structures as time went on. And each of those smaller structures would form uh, individual stars or perhaps clusters of stars. So we believe now that at least the most massive ellipticals uh, that we see in the today's universe. formed at very high redshift at a very early cosmic epoch uh, through protogalactic collapse uh the other scenario which is external and fast uh, is uh, via galaxy mergers uh, ram pressure uh, stripping of gas now uh, what is the time scale of a galaxy merger it's typically 10 raised to 9 years uh Uh, the ram pressure stripping of gas is also of that uh, same order so within about 1/10 of the lifetime of the universe uh, these uh, uh, mergers can happen or galaxies can fall into clusters lose their gas and uh, uh, these are fast processes but externally driven driven by uh, uh, the cluster environment or driven by mergers uh if you look at slow processes they are referred to in the literature as secular evolution uh, which is basically uh, uh, of two kinds one is the internal secular evolution wherein the a galaxy just is there by itself it is slowly accreting gas it is slowly forming stars uh, uh, it's influenced by its spiral structure it's influenced by its nuclear black hole etc etc but it is happening without any external influence and the process is slow so we refer to this as internal uh, secular evolution and uh, uh, the milky way is definitely in the secular evolution kind of mode uh, has been through most of its history it it may be both internal and external okay mostly internal but it has undergone uh, prolonged gas and fall uh, minor mergers and so on we are not in a particularly dense environment so the environmental effect on the milky way is not very large although we know that in the future uh, when we merge with the andromeda galaxy that influence is going to be very large and here <clears throat> so we are trying to understand all of these sort of global properties of galaxies without worrying too much about all the stuff that is in here and the reason we do that is that these processes seem to be relatively less influenced by the details of what happens here and another reason we do it is that these processes we don't understand fully at all there are a lot of uncertainties lot of things to be worked out uh if uh, we want to understand these phenomena very complex uh, physics goes in there much of it not very tractable analytically so more much of the work that happens here is via numerical simulations uh so that of course takes a long time and then the right physics has to be put in and tested feedback plays a very important role in galaxy evolution uh so uh, you can think of the uh, galaxy in for uh, uh, formation and evolution happening uh, in in a sort of cyclical sort of way so let us say we uh, start with a normal galaxy 
uh, which contain uh, a, contains a dead quasar, which means the black hole at its center is not active, uh, it's lying dormant. Uh, that normal galaxies will undergo hierarchical growth, okay, that will lead to galaxy mergers. Uh, galaxy mergers can, are often accompanied by uh, uh, gas inflows, okay, which leads to uh, starbursts and buried quasars. By buried quasars, one means uh, things which are uh, uh, which are not yet active but are in the process of of starting up. Okay, uh, this. Uh, once the quasar starts to eat mass, uh, it lead to the growth of the supermassive black hole. Uh, the supermassive black hole, once it turns on, uh, will give you the active uh, uh, galactic nucleus. Once you have an active galactic nucleus, we saw that even more uh, powerful than uh, the feedback from supernovae is the feedback from EGN, although it is short-lived. Uh, lots of energetic energy gets fed back into the system. And this AGN feedback is what can actually turn off the AGN itself. So the AGN uh, uh, sort of kills itself and we go back to, uh, to this normal galaxy. And this process can repeat over the lifetime of any given galaxy. Uh, this interplay between the turning off of the AGN and turning on of the AGN and the effect on star formation and uh, gas evolution, et cetera, uh, is all, uh, it could all be driven by these factors. Okay. So suppose we want to say, okay, now we want to look at proto galaxies. We want to look at the earliest galaxies. We've already looked at Lyman break galaxies, which are pretty high redshift but they're biased. They're all star forming galaxies. They're not quiescent galaxies. Uh, but first you have to define what is a proto galaxy. When do you say a galaxy is formed? Galaxy in the first X percent or Y years of its life, do you call it, let's say in the first giga year of its life, uh, is it the thing? Or galaxy which has formed X percent of its stars, 5%, 10% of its stars is a proto galaxy. Galaxy which has assembled X percent of its final mass. Okay. And, and here all these X and Ys are, there is no physical principle to determine that unambiguously. So you choose whatever, different people choose different numbers for X and Y. Or are you going to call a proto galaxy simply an initial density fluctuation which has not formed any stars yet? <coughs> uh, or you're going to say that, okay, I won't worry about all of these things. I will call anything which is uh, at a redshift higher than a certain redshift uh, as a proto galaxy. Uh, generally, we think of progenitors of massive galaxies today, roughly in the first giga year of their life. So, so that is one commonly used uh, definition, uh, galaxy in the first Y years of its life. Uh, which is one giga year, which is typically. So, which means you have to go and look for progenitors at redshifts greater than five, because at redshift five, the age of the universe is approximately one giga year. Uh, so, you, you have to look there. Uh, we expect certain, uh, we certainly expect vigorous star formation to be occurring and therefore luminous objects. So, which is good because if you're looking for proto galaxies and they're uh, as it is, they're going to be faint. But if they're not star forming, they will be even fainter. So, you'll never be able to detect them. So, the Malmquist bias uh, does not hamper you in this case, but because you know that you're only looking for luminous objects. When these proto galaxies form, they're basically dissipating energy. Okay. Uh, and that's why you are able to see them. So when they collapse, they cool, uh, they collapse and cool. And then the binding energy, which comes from the potential energy of the gas that forms the galaxy, uh, as the gas infalls, it loses potential energy. And that potential energy gets transformed uh, into two things. One is that it gets radiatively uh, radiated off. Okay, so that is quantified by the amount of mass that can cool radiatively uh, in units of 10 raised to 11 m sun. And 
the other thing that happens is uh, the gas uh, can get uh, uh, can get velocities okay so can get some kinetic energy so the potential energy gets basically is either radiated out or gets converted into kinetic energy uh, so so this is a 3d velocity in units of uh, 250 uh, kilometers per second right now the one more thing happens as the gas collapses and cools is that the gas begins to form stars. And that process has a further uh, energetics uh, involved with it. Uh, so, uh, so it depends on the total mass converted uh, to stars, uh, the average star mass, average star radius, et cetera. And uh, that, gives you, that gives you a number for the binding energy that gets released by the collapsing proto stars, not by the collapsing proto galactic cloud, but by individual uh, clouds uh, forming uh, fragmented clouds forming stars. And of course, then once the stars are formed, one more uh, energy term comes into the equation, uh, which is your delta mc square coming from your uh, fusion. Uh, and that is of the order of uh, 10 raised to uh, 60, right? Uh, and then, of course, it depends on the mass that gets converted to stars. Okay. Now, that's not just stars, the supermassive black hole forms. It forms an accretion disk and uh, it begins to radiate. And the amount of energy that it puts out uh, depends on its power and depends on its uh, average duration of uh, an active episode. Okay. Uh, so we know, we believe that the duty cycle of AGN is somewhere between 1% and 10%, uh, depending on the AGN, depending on the AGN mass and its uh, and the properties of the galaxies in which it sits. Uh, so that delta T uh, is typically 10 raised to eight years. Uh, so if you want to think of an AGN the picture, you think of uh, AGN being present in every galaxy, uh, it turns on, it shines for 10 raised to 8 years. And then for 10 raised to 9 years after that, it does nothing. It's quiet. And then it restarts. Uh, of course, this number, uh, the duty cycle is uh, maybe redshift dependent. But in the nearby universe, certainly this is a very reasonable assumption. And in the high redshift universe, the duty cycle may be higher. Redshift to Okay, so, so now we know how much, roughly how much energy gets released for a typical protoelliptical galaxy uh, form, forming uh, at some redshift. Uh, so that number is of the order of 10 raised to 60 ergs per second. So now if you want to, con to convert, so we are doing this exercise only to find out uh, I've asked the question, uh, what is going to be the brightness of a proto-elliptical galaxy at high redshift, say at redshift six? And can I detect it with modern telescopes? Okay, simple question. For that, you need to know how much energy is getting released and on what time scales. Okay. So the relevant time scales could be the starburst time scale, 10 raised to seven, 10 raised to eight years. Uh, why is that time scale? Because that is the lifetime of the most massive uh, luminous stars, which contribute a lot to the luminosity. The O and B stars are of O, B and A stars are of that lifetime. Uh, the free fall time uh, of 10 raised to eight years. So this is also the time scale on which galaxies, big galaxies rotate around each other. Uh, it's uh, also the time scale uh, uh, on which internal secular evolution happens. Uh, but uh, if merging is there in the picture, then the merging time scale is 10 raised to 9 years. So there is a bit of uncertainty, uh, 10 raised to 8 to 10 raised to 9 years at least, uh, wherein this proto-elliptical may have formed, right? Uh, so if you plug in 10 raised to 8, 10 raised to 9 into this, then you will get a luminosity of 10 raised to 11 to 10 raised to 12 uh, solar luminosities. 
for the luminosity of the protoelectrical. This is very, very bright. Okay. This, uh, the Milky Way uh, with 10 raised to 11 stars or few times 10 raised to 11 stars has a luminosity which is roughly 10 raised to 11 epsilon. So a Milky Way-like luminous galaxy is that protoelectrical. Uh, so fortunately, quite, quite, quite luminous, uh, but at a large distance. So you, once you know the absolute magnitude of that galaxy, uh, you can calculate what is going to be the apparent magnitude uh, given your cosmology and so on. Uh, so you'll get between 26 and 30 magnitudes. So these are mostly AB magnitudes. So nowadays, everybody has switched to AB. Uh, Vega magnitudes are mostly gone. Uh, a few percentage of the total energy is in recombination lines like lamina. Okay. So that's quite considerable. So if you have narrow line uh, instruments, uh, if you have a Lyman tunable Lyman alpha filter, you can look for these protoellipticals at very high redshift. Now the question is, is there a dust obscuration? Uh, you may argue that the metallicity is too low for dust obscuration to be there. But there are some mysteries there. We are finding a non-trivial number of objects uh, which are very massive and also at high metallicity at high redshift. So we clearly don't understand how uh, star formation is happening in the first uh, giga year or two of the universe lifetime. So it, it's pretty rapid. I mean, you'll have to invoke some very, very top heavy IMFs uh, to, uh, to create so much dust uh, in such a short time. So, but if you have reason to believe that there's no dust, then you can use optical or IR uh, telescopes to detect such galaxies. Uh, if you believe for some reason that these objects are dusty, then submillimeter far infrared surveys are the right way to go. So uh, this is a very, very high redshift galaxy uh, called NB973. Uh, I forget what the redshift is. I should put it down. Uh, so here it's an I-band dropout. So Z-band dropout, nothing there. But if you put in a, a narrow band filter, um, I think 973 would be nanometers, so 9730 angstroms. Uh, that uh, narrow band filter picks it up. And uh, what is it picking up here? Huh? Yes, I think you're on the right track. It, yeah, Lyman alpha line. So this is the emission from Lyman alpha. So if you divide 9730 by... Uh, uh, 1 to 1, 6, uh, you will get the 1 plus Z of this. So it's probably redshift 7 plus. That's your uh, uh, protoelliptical. And uh, you can, uh, so this is the redshift 7 roughly. Uh, redshift 6.96 .6 Lyman alpha emitter. That's your Lyman alpha emission line. These are all skylines and so on, but very, very clear uh, signal there. That's why you see it. The filter just covers this much and uh, picks it up. You can use photometric redshifts to predict which galaxies are likely to be high redshift. Okay. And so these are all different candidate high redshift uh, galaxies as per the SEDs that are fitted. And then, of course, uh, with the Lyman alpha uh, emitter technique, with the narrow band filter technique, uh, you are able to pick them up quite uh, easily. Uh, getting a spectrum is still quite expensive. So there are many, many objects, uh, many possibly many thousands of objects which are candidate high redshift uh, uh, galaxies uh, by their photometric redshifts. Uh, a few hundred of them have been observed as Lyman alpha emitters. And uh, maybe a few tens have been confirmed via spectroscopy, which picks up the Lyman alpha line. There is a little bit of 
problems uh, problem in this game because you are assuming that the one line that you are seeing is lyman alpha uh, if it is not if it is some other line uh, then there is a problem but uh, uh, so ideally when you want to fix a redshift you should get at least two lines because then then you're un unambiguously able to identify the redshift so some people doubt uh, some of these redshifts uh, but others say that no, no. Anyway, you don't expect any other line to be as bright uh, if it is uh, at high redshift. <clears throat> uh, and at so, high redshift, the metallicity is very low, so we shouldn't expect any other lines as bright. Uh, you shouldn't expect any metal lines, but could you pick up uh, uh, instead of Lyman alpha, are you picking up H alpha? Okay. okay. If you are, then uh, then you are in trouble because not at very high redshift then. okay <laughs> yeah so that uh, you're right i mean there's very little chance of getting a strong uh, metal line but there are lots of hydrogen lines which can cause trouble right uh, so so with this kind of study we are able to construct the madau lily diagram at high redshift and now it's become quite clear uh, with a number of observations uh, that the star formation rate density of the universe is steadily declining beyond redshift, say four or so, to fairly low values. This is going down by about one and a half or two orders of magnitude. So just as it rises by two orders of magnitude from redshift zero to two, then says relatively flat and then falls by two orders of magnitude uh, by the time you get to redshift 10 or 12. Uh, now here there are some candidates which are if candidate is at redshift 12 and so on. Okay, so there are there are degeneracies there and it's primarily related to confusion about uh, whether this is Lyman alpha or not. Which break? Ha, huh, so this, this just indicates uh, uh, constraints at uh, for for this galaxy being at redshift 12 and not being at redshift 12. So don't worry too much about these bands. Okay. So this is a galaxy from the Hubble ultra deep uh, survey field. Okay. Ultra deep field, and uh, there uh, they identified some very high candidate candidate uh, high redshift galaxies. But they're not able to get the redshifts uh, uh, with any high level of confidence. So they have put constraints based on the things being at uh, uh, redshift uh, at different redshifts. Okay. Uh, from the simulations, uh, we are not able to have that level of high fidelity simulations to predict when the first galaxies form. So we believe that, so, so the current understanding is anywhere between Z of 20 and six, definitely not six, maybe eight. We, we have good, good uh, candidates, verified candidates at redshift eight. So between redshift 20 and redshift eight, uh, which is a period of about 200 million years or so. Uh, in that time, the first galaxies form. Now, exactly when they formed, we don't know, but we will know literally within the year or something like that because of JWST will find these objects directly. So within a year, we will have much better constraints on also on the star formation rate density at redshifts beyond four. So, um... yeah. So you are quoting a wide range of redshift. So um, is it because we have uh, different definitions of what is the first, what do we call a first galaxy? Uh, yes. So see, you can have any consistent definition. Okay. Different people in different pe papers are using a different de uh, definition. But so long as they define what they mean by the first galaxy, uh, there is no problem as such. I mean, if somebody says that uh, if a galaxy is uh, uh, within one giga year of its first star, 
that I will call as a first galaxy or proto galaxy. So that is okay. Uh, we can we can work with any consistent definition. Huh. That is in the first galaxy watch from the There might be similar they will find them as well. Okay. How can it find JWST can find uh, UV emission uh, with the NIRCAM camera, I think goes up to about 25 microns. So it can find uh, Lyman alpha up to uh, uh, one plus Z equals uh, 25,000 divided by one to one six. So redshift 20 roughly. It will not be able to go beyond that. But if we encounter a situation where it is uh, finding say redshift uh, uh, 13, 14, 15, but nothing beyond that, then that will put strong constraints on uh, the first stars formed at redshift 15. Okay. And we are also trying to do, we are not trying to find the absolute first star in the universe because our observable universe is finite. Uh, so we don't know where is the absolute first star in the universe. We are just trying to find out statistically when, when it sort of took off. So if there is, because remember JWS is small field of view, so it can't observe uh, the whole sky and find the highest redshift galaxy. Uh, it can only observe a small portion of the sky, but it will give you enough numbers for uh, robust statistics. Okay, uh, so uh, continuing on. So uh, just a recap of what all we have covered in the course so far. Uh, so I had shown you this slide uh, in the beginning, I think, in the first lecture. Uh, so we did some background material and overview, a brief uh, history of extragalactic research. We looked at morphologies and morphological classification. Uh, we looked at uh, quantitative morphology, the bulge disk decomposition and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> we looked at the luminosity functions of galaxies. Uh, then we looked at, uh, at normal galaxies, uh, spiral and irregular galaxies, uh, then the stellar kinematics of the disks, uh, uh, the properties of uh, elliptical and lenticular galaxies, and the stellar kinematics uh, of uh, 3D systems, which are basically velocity dispersion dominated systems rather than velocity dominated systems. We completely skipped uh, gas and dust in galaxies. Uh, that is primarily because that's going to be covered in your ISM IGM course. Uh, then we looked at population synthesis models and how they can be used to estimate the global properties of galaxies like star formation rates, stellar mass, etc. Uh, then we looked at uh, the role of interactions, mergers, etc. And uh, we looked specifically at the star formation properties of uh, star formation in galaxies and very heavy star formation galaxies like star Wars. Uh, galaxy interactions and mergers and galaxy groups, we didn't cover in too much detail, but we looked at the properties of galaxy clusters and how their mass can be estimated uh, from the motions of their galaxies. We completely skipped uh, galactic nuclei and nuclear black holes, and of course the related active galaxies and quasars, because you have a full course, a 14 lecture course coming up in your next quarter, uh, which will cover all of this. From, from the formation and evolution uh, perspective, we didn't look at the cosmological framework because I expect your cosmology course will would have uh, covered that. Uh, we uh, uh, we didn't look in great deal, we looked briefly at the growth of structure uh, in the universe. Uh, and then we looked at how galaxy formation happens for different classes of galaxies uh, for high and particularly focused on the properties of high Z galaxies and uh, evolution. Uh, we did not look at a very important area of research, which is the reionization epoch uh, and the properties of the intergalactic medium uh, throughout the history of the universe, because again, your ISM IGM course uh, will, will cover that. And uh, we looked a bit of uh, a bit at the observational aspects of uh, of dark matter uh, in in mostly in the galaxy context, uh, 
there are there are probes of dark matter uh, which are very different I mean, there are more direct probes for example trying to find candidate dark matter uh, objects uh, we didn't look too much at that and then we looked at the effect of gravitational lensing strong lensing as well as weak lensing and how that can be used to probe the large scale structure of the universe uh, so uh, so we uh, we don't have too many gaps in the course uh, this course I, uh, I I picked up from uh, a course at MIT. This, this is sort of the syllabus uh, uh, that they have. And uh, so we've covered everything except the portions that are going to be covered in other courses, uh, which are either ongoing or, or are coming in the next term. So this, this particular course has very strong uh, connections with two courses that are coming in the next quarter, uh, which is your ISM IGM course as well as your active galaxies course. Okay, so I'm going to spend the remaining half an hour uh, talking about uh, uh, some large projects uh, where, which I expect within the next few years or the next decade or so are going to completely change the study of galaxies. Um, optical spectroscopy is the most uh, sort of efficient bang for the buck uh, uh, thing that gives you maximum knowledge about what is going on in the galaxy. So optical spectroscopy is therefore very, very important. Uh, traditionally, optical spectroscopy used to be done with slits. Uh, starting with the Sloan Digital uh, Sky Survey, it uh, started to be done with individual fibers. And uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey obtained uh, fiber uh, spectra of more than 2 million galaxies. And just by placing a fiber at the center of the galaxy, they, they got information about the galaxy. So although things like uh, uh, the redshift and so on were very accurately determined via this method, uh, we had very little knowledge about what was going on outside. Okay? Which means, suppose there was a lot of star formation happening in the outskirts of a galaxy, and you take a spectrum only of its center, uh, which is quiescent, you will not know anything about the active star formation in the outskirts. So to overcome this limitation, one uses a technique called 3D spectroscopy or integral field uh, spectroscopy. So the idea is very simple. The idea is basically to try and get a spectrum of every pixel of the galaxy. And uh, <clears throat> one of the most <clears throat> efficient ways of doing that is to actually gr group together fibers, individual fibers into a bundle. So what you see here is a hexagonal uh, hexagon. And within the hexagon, you see uh, lots of these uh, little circles. Each circle is a fiber. And light that falls on that fiber goes down uh, the fiber and goes to a spectrum. So at every fiber will give you one spectrum. And therefore, if you tile a galaxy with many, many fibers uh, like this one, you will get many, many uh, spectra, that many spectra. Every circle here will give you one spectra. So this idea has been, uh, has been taken to a very, very high level uh, as part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, they have a project, they had a project called Manga, uh, which observed more than 10,000 galaxies in this way. Right? Now, what is the advantage of doing that? If you get a spectrum for the entire object uh, like this, you tile it with fibers, you are able to get simultaneously uh, the stellar velocities. So you can choose a line which is uh, emitted or absorbed by stars and see how that line moves, what is the Doppler velocity for different points in your, in your uh, integral field spectrum, and you can get the rotation of the stars. Similarly, uh, if you say, if you take the H alpha emission, okay, now once you know the, uh, actually you know, need to know the gas velocities to correct for the uh, H alpha emission, uh, so what you uh, so you, let's say you go here and you take let's say h alpha uh, h alpha in each pixel may be there but it will be slightly blue shifted red shifted depending on the gas velocity so you can compute the gas velocity map uh, 
of the galaxy and uh, then uh, you can construct uh, then you take out the doppler shifts and align all the h alpha lines uh, add them together you can construct the h alpha map so now with this we can find out how much uh, star formation is happening in different parts of the galaxy so uh, presumably these dark regions are uh, active regions of star formation and so on so we are and once you know this of course you can uh, with the spectrum determine the metallicity and you can also determine the metallicity gradient of the galaxy so you can find out that okay is is the disk higher metallicity than the bulge or vice versa normally it's not true normally disk will always be high metallicity compared to the bulge but how much higher and how, what is the metallicity gradient as a function of the radius all of these things used to be the major projects so there were people who said that i will do it for five galaxies 10 galaxies and so on now we have 10000 galaxies the data are all public it's reduced all of these maps are available for each of them so you can do studies which uh, you could not even envisage before statistical studies of different kinds so now you can they've taken within manga they've taken care to span all morphologies so there are reasonably equal number of uh, ellipticals and spirals and lenticulars and so on they've also spanned a large range of uh, stellar masses so you the quite uh, all the way from about 10 to 8.5 to 10 to 11.5 uh, a galaxy is have been sampled uh, they unfortunately cannot go to very high redshift okay or even moderate redshift because the galaxy become very faint and small and uh, this ifu technique uh, fails so but out to about redshift of 0.1 they have observed these uh, 10000 galaxies real dramatic uh, dramatically altered the way in which we uh, study galaxies uh they uh with this with the older generation uh, they bundled fibers together so what they do is so for example in the sloan uh, spectrograph they have 1000 fibers right so what you can do is uh, you can say that so the biggest fiber bundle which is this one i think if you count the circles here you will find there are some 127 circles so there is a fiber bundle of 127 then so the the fibers are actually grouped together like that and tied together and fixed over here this is the thing the probe that goes into the focal plane now you have used up 127 fibers out of 1000 now you have still have other fibers available so what they did was they said that okay 127 uh, fibers will, will be our largest uh, fiber bundle we'll have smaller fiber bundles so you can have smaller hexagons with fewer number of fibers which are collected together from these other 1000 fibers now at the other end of the fiber it's already fixed into the the spectrogram so there you don't make any changes that uh, will give you a spectrum number 1 spectrum number 2 spectrum number 3 up to spectrum number 1000 but how you bundle them is in your control huh all ccds all ccds yeah so you you how you bundle them so you you can say that okay i have uh, right now in this part of the sky i have three big galaxies so i'll do three 127 fiber bundles and for some smaller galaxies i will do smaller fiber bundles yeah attached to the focal plane they are attached to the uh, they are attached to the uh, spectrograph so this on one side this part is on the focal plane and the other end of the fiber is attached to the spectrograph right so there have been a number of uh, integral field spectrograph driven projects the first one was called sauron uh, then there is uh, more recently there was the sami survey uh, which was uh, done in australia khalifa which was done in europe uh, muse so there is a integral field spectrograph now on the vlt uh, 
which uh, is very, very powerful, uh, primarily because, of course, it's a very good instrument, but it also sits on eight meter class telescope. All the other integral field square spectrographs are on much smaller telescopes. Now, these kind of spectrographs are being built and being used in most of the large telescopes of the world. So the newest version of the SDSS has a project called the Local Volume Mapper, which will carry out IFU spectroscopy of parts of the Milky Way and several more nearby galaxies. So there's no reason to do this only in the thing. You can do it in the Milky Way as well. Earlier, they didn't do it in the Milky Way because there's no way to determine distance and everything is moving and uh, disentangling Doppler shifts is too complicated. But now we can attempt to do it because with Gaia, we have a three-dimensional velocity map of stars and gas, and therefore we know how to, how to move things. Yeah. And now, uh, not integral fiber field spectroscopy, but the old technique of multi-fiber spectroscopy, fiber at the center of every galaxy, so the successor of SDSS is already here in that, uh, which is called DESI, uh, Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Uh, it's carrying out a survey uh, with, uh, and there uh, you're not bundling them together, but you're positioning them uh, at uh, wherever you have a galaxy. Now this used to be done by hand, by drilling plates and then actually manually plugging in one fiber at a time. But now with DAISY, they have uh, put a robot to do this. Uh, so there are 5,000 fibers. And the robot is so fast, it can put 5,000 fibers, I think, in one minute or two minutes, something like that. So it just positions uh, everything. So three fibers, uh, stick with the robot or something, they can move or? Uh, there, the, each fiber has its own robot. So it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not something with two hands moving it. But each fiber uh, can move. Can move, move uh, yeah. So there are 5,000 mini robots, uh, each of which know where to go, but they have to not uh, clash, crash into each other while crossing. So it, it's, a, it's a rearrangement. And of course, there are algorithms to do it optimally and fast and all that. So they just rearrange. So you rearrange, you point the telescope to some new field where you have 5,000 galaxies you want to image to get spectra off, you press the robot start button, it puts it at those 5,000 positions. Then you gather, you start tracking those 5,000 galaxies. You gather spectra for about an hour. And then you say, now I want the next 5,000. You again ask the robot to move the telescope to the new field. Then the robot again repositions everything. So what is the size of each of Each of what? The robots, uh, I can, uh, I don't have a picture here, but if you go to the DAISY website, uh, yeah, the focal plane is about this big. So the robots uh, are very small. They are like a pencil or thickness of a pencil kind of thing. And the fiber, of course, is micron sized uh, thing at the center, 20 micron kind of. The, each robot is like a pencil. Uh, DAISY is being carried out in, uh, in California, uh, in the Kid Peak uh, Observatory in Arizona, sorry, not California. So it has just started about six months back or something. And is this a space pilot already started? Or just... uh, they have also just uh, installed this new spectrograph. So they also uh, have a robotic uh, aligner, which is uh, uh, just last year they set it up. So it's just getting started now. If this is space five years already started. Yeah, yeah. Officially, it started in 2020, but they needed to do a lot of upgrades to the hardware. So for nearly one year, no observations were possible. So they have finished the hardware uh, upgrades now about six months back and they have started. I don't know whether they've officially started or still testing and commissioning, but it's working now. Yes, yes, 
with already existing imaging catalog. So you don't know which galaxy you want to observe. So for DESI, they did their own imaging. So just like SDSS had imaging first and then spectroscopy, DESI said, we want to observe uh, fainter galaxies. So we will do our own imaging. So they carried out their own imaging survey. Telescope is four meters. This is 2.5. These are not very big. But that's the thing. This kind of massive multiplexing uh, allows you to do things 100,000 times faster than you would have. So uh, this is some very old uh, image from, from Sauron. Okay. Uh, so this is a galaxy. Uh, you have uh, the central region uh, of the galaxy. And it has a counter-rotating core. Okay, there is you see this blue and red here and blue and red there. So 90 degrees misaligned uh, with the rest of the rotation of the galaxy is a core, which is rotating uh, 90 degrees offset uh, rotation axis. So one can zoom in over there, and then one can do stars and galaxies, and I mean sorry, stars and gas velocities and so. On. This means that this part is coming towards uh, us. This part is going away from us. Okay, in a normal galaxy, this stretches from center to out, outside, right? Uh, but here, the overall galaxy is coming towards us from here and going away from us from here. So it is rotating like this. But in the center, there is a core which is rotating like this. So the core is faster. Uh, it's not faster, but direction of rotation is uh, different. See, if you there is one axis of rotation which is uh, sort of like this, which corresponds to these guys. Okay, and for these guys, there is an axis of rotation like this. So there are two axes of rotation: one for the outer region, one for the inner region, and they have an angle of about ninety. Huh? Yes, very likely. Yeah. Yes. So what can happen is uh, this can reflect a dry merger. There is a galaxy with some angular momentum, small galaxy, dwarf galaxy kind of, but fast rotating and it has gone into the core. It's still rotating. But rare object, huh? this don't take this as this has just been shown so that it's uh, something novel, exciting. No, not many galaxies are like this. Very few galaxies are like this. Yes. So this, uh, this amount of information, it has so much information. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it has it has gone through the roof. Yeah, I mean truly. In the old days, no, we used to just look at one object very carefully and think about it and analyze it. Now it's like, if you do that, it's like, God, by the time you, you will take 10,000 years to analyze all your data. And it's increasing at an ever increasing rate. So it's an exponential growth in data. No human can now, uh, so now people are saying uh, humans should give up as doing astronomy. Okay, just have machines. Machine learning or AI, it can't, it can't do this. Yeah, you can't do it without that. That's what. So people are saying, take humans out of the equation. Okay, they are too slow and they make too many mistakes. So astronomy is, is I think in 20, 30 years, it will be outside our domain. It will just be machines. Yeah. So one more machine which is being built now is this one, the, the Rubin uh, LSST Observatory. Uh, this is a recent uh, uh, photograph. I hope it is a photograph. There's some red line here. Yeah, I think it is a photograph. It's fully constructed. Uh, the dome and the rest of the telescope building, everything is ready. Uh, it's in a remote site in uh, Chile. It's called uh, Cerro Pachon. It's uh, uh, like most other sites in Chile, it's uh, very, very uh, 
dark and clear skies, no rain, nothing, nothing. Very dry, no vegetation. In uh, I had gone many years ago to Chile, and uh, there one of the highlights was to go and see the nearest tree. <laughs> so we drove for about 15 20 kilometers and there on some stream bed there was a tree so we went and we saw the tree and we came back <laughs> no other tree no other tree not even plants like nothing nothing absolutely nothing no no there are some shrubs and so on i mean at this height but a proper tree, uh, huh, very, there are no giant cactuses here. There are very small shrubs are there. Some little grass and all may be there. But tree is 20 kilometers away, 50 kilometers away. Tree. Extraordinary place. Uh, the main, uh, yeah. Uh, you were showing us that the water, like it's, it contains five thousands of the uh, fibers. Fibers. So, can nanotechnology and other things improve this further? It might. It might. Yeah. So, are there projects that are using nanotechnology to, you know, develop this thing even further? I think at some level, nanotechnology may be being used here also. Okay. In terms of the accuracy of the positioning and so on, it has to be very exact. It can't be like off, then instead of galaxy, you'll get blank sky. Yeah, because if we use nanotechnology, then maybe we can use even, like we can get experience. See, we are using nanotechnology in the instruments. So when we are building the CCDs, that is all nanotechnology already. So uh, the fibers themselves, uh, the robots are basically little computers. And they use, in the, they have silicon chips inside. So that's also nanotechnology. Uh, so the main advantage of this uh, uh, Rubin uh, Observatory, so now it used to be called Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Now it is called uh, the Rubin Observatory. And this is the telescope of that observatory. And uh, uh, LSST is now being relabeled as Large Survey of Space and Time. And the idea is the main advantage of the LSST is this massive field of view, okay? So whenever you, one of the figures of merit of the efficiency of any survey telescope is something known as Eton dew. And Eton dew is simply the product of the size of the primary uh, diameter, uh, mirror in, uh, in meters multiplied by the field of view in, uh, in square degrees, okay? So, uh, so this is 3.5 degrees in diameter compared to the Keck, which is 0.2 degrees in diameter. So although LSST is a much smaller telescope than the Keck, uh, it, its Eton view is much higher because its field of view is very, very large. Now, what is this white circle over here? the LSST needs to have a secondary mirror, which is very large in order to get this very large field of view. So the secondary mirror blocks uh, a lot of the light uh, falling onto the primary mirror. And so the effective area is only this annulus uh, in blue. Unlike the cake, which is a very small secondary, and you get the full 10 meter diameter. Right. So for comparison, full moon is half a degree. So seven full moons uh, will fit into one field of view. Uh, you should take the area of, uh, you should take the effective diameter of the primary mirror. So uh, here it is eight meters in diameter, but the effective uh, 8.4 meters in diameter but the effective uh, diameter is only 6.5 meters. So it's equivalent to a 6.5. So you take the equivalent diameter multiplied by the area of this circle in square degrees. So this is the Eton view of the LSST telescope uh, compared or the LSST telescope and camera uh, compared to many other things. So see where SDSS is, see where Subaru is, 
uh, and see where LSST is. Uh, tremendous atonia. Uh, this kind of atonia. Huh? This, we, are not, uh, uh, we are not sacrificing anything, but we are paying a big price uh, in terms of money. And uh, we are also, uh, in terms of time, this project has been going on for, uh, 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 for about 25 years. And it has been actively going on for at least 15 years. So 15 years ago, I was offered a postdoc uh, to work with LSST. Uh, so even now, now it is next two years. After two years, the data will start flowing in full flow. So it has been going on for a very long time. Because many technological challenges were there. So you can achieve this massive uh, field of view by designing a, uh, lens optics accordingly. But then your field of view is so large, you need a big camera to fill it, fill the focal plane. Uh, so that is uh, achieved via a three point two gigapixel camera okay. and yeah Pratamesh you are saying something yeah so the effective area of the LSST is small so that will so we will have an increment in exposure time right yeah yeah so uh, eton view will go down but that's okay because you're observing a very wide area in one shot mm -hmm. okay so you can observe for a little bit longer okay Mm -hmm. huh? You will not get the full depth that you will get with a full 8.4 meter. So now these are 4K by 4K uh, uh, science uh, uh, grade CCDs. And each C nine CCDs are grouped together into a raft. Okay. And then there are 15 plus 621 rafts on the camera. This whole thing is about this size in diameter, about a meter in diameter. It's so big. And uh, each raft is an individually testable unit, uh, which contains nine individual CCDs, and then uh, assembled together into what is called as a tower. Okay, And its tower is an autonomous, fully testable 144 megapixel camera okay? with 10 micron pixels. This whole camera and associated filters and everything, uh, support electronics, cooling, vacuum pipes, etc., is the size of a car. Only the camera <laughs> is the size of a car. And uh, it also is the weight of a car. So it weighs more than 1,000 kilograms, uh, everything together. Huge. So the filters are also very large. The filters are this big glass, which is blue colored, green colored, red colored, which is this big in diameter. And what it will achieve is illustrated here. Uh, so what you see on the left is what the LSST depth uh, will achieve. And uh, this has been done with a current generation camera with some few many nights of integration, 100 hours or something like that on the left. And the same galaxy observed on the right with the LSST. Sorry, with the SDSS. So this is what you will see with the SDSS. The same galaxy observed with LSST will look like this. Okay. So it's completely going to change the picture for individual galaxies and, and uh, to say nothing of the galaxies in the background. Because you'll find many, many more. Yeah, you can see all the tidal streams and uh, things like that very, very clearly. And uh, over here with SDSS, we are just seeing some some blob. It's formed by the motion of the galaxy. It's formed by some merger uh, by its own merger history. Yeah, and of course, many faint galaxies like dwarf galaxies will be found. What LSST will allow you to do in the high redshift universe is also interesting. So what is shown here and on the y-axis is something known as the L star volume. Okay. So for a galaxy brighter than L star, L star is the uh, break in the luminosity function above which the number of galaxies falls exponentially. So if you take a L star galaxy, that's a B magnitude of minus 21 or so. Uh, if you take a L star galaxy to what volume, how much volume can you probe with a particular 
uh, with a particular survey. Okay, so uh, with LSST, you will be able to uh, actually find the L star galaxy out to redshift of nearly six to 5.5. You will be able to find, detect any galaxy brighter than L star. And the volume that you will sample is given on the y-axis. So that is 10 raised to 12 uh, megaparsec cube. So it's enormous volume that can be sampled. Thousand, uh, 10 raised to 12 megaparsec cube will be 1000 uh, gigaparsec cube. Oh, luminosity functions are based on the no, no, this is just, uh, what do you mean by observations? Luminosity functions are based on the observation. So if you have a galaxy of a certain brightness, how far can you detect it? And therefore, what volume does that cover? What I'm saying is, if we detect a lot of galaxies above this L star, then the definition of the function will itself change. You know, the L star will also change. Huh, you, but we don't expect to do that. We expect to find a lot of galaxies much below L star, not above it. Because the Mamkus bias doesn't prevent you from detecting bright galaxies. It pre prevents you from detecting the low luminosity galaxies. So below L star, yes, you will find lots. So this is uh, another representation for distant galaxies. So what is shown here is... Uh, is Lyman break galaxies at uh, different redshifts, three, four, five, six, seven. Their characteristic spectrum. So this is a spectrum of a star forming galaxy. What is shown here is the kind of depth that will be achieved. So if these triangles, why are there triangles here? Because uh, uh, with LSST, you will have one uh, shallow uh, imaging uh, component and there will be a low, small area, deep component also. And that is true with Vista and with Spitzer also. Uh, but with, if, if this triangle lies above the galaxy, then that galaxy is not going to get detected with that uh, telescope at that frequency. So on the x-axis, you have wavelength. So LSST is so sensitive that in almost all the bands, it is going to be able to detect uh, these uh, redshifted uh, galaxies uh, at different, different redshifts. Uh, so these are the, the six bands of the LSST with their uh, depths uh, represented. And as you can see, because it is so, it goes to 26 magnitude or fainter in almost all the bands, uh, you are able to detect these Lyman break galaxies at high redshift. This is for red sequence galaxies, a similar plot. The spectrum has now changed because these are passively evolving elliptical like uh, galaxies, which have been, which are at different redshifts up to redshift four. And there too, LSST will be able to detect up to redshift uh, two or 2.5, uh, is going to be able to detect the galaxy, the galaxy is lying above the triangle for the LSST, the, this particular uh, cyan color redshift two object. So it'll make in the field of galaxies, it will make contributions to finding new populations at high redshift. It'll find lots of dwarf galaxies, low surface brightness galaxies. We'll be able to better measure mergers, interactions, and the environment because you, you know, I mean, if there's a like a low uh, richness cluster, right now you won't find it because you won't find all the other companions. Now you'll find it. We'll be able to better quantify the various biases like the Mampus bias and the uncertainties. Uh, we'll be able to find lots of new clusters, study evolution of cluster galaxies. We'll be able to even study intra-cluster light. So we've assumed, so that we, throughout this course, is that there are very few stars. There's lots of gas in the intra-cluster medium, but there are very few stars in the intra-cluster medium. But that may not be true. And there may be a few stars. And if those stars become turn into novae, then they produce enough light for LSST to spot them. So you would be able to spot novae that lie outside uh, of uh, galaxies. And then the halo occupation uh, distribution, which we sort of 
assume when we go from halos to to galaxies that will be better constrained once we have uh, once we can measure the luminosity function uh, out to very very faint levels faint luminosities and the data as you said data is going to be so vast uh, it will not be possible for finite astronomers uh, number of astronomers to do it to use all the data so a lot of citizen science projects are have started with other telescope uh, surveys but with lsst that will be a major component uh, citizen science program for citizen scientists to work with the data huh? citizen science program meaning uh, you can look up something called galaxy zoo okay so what they do is that they show you an image of a galaxy and they say that okay you classify it as uh, spiral or elliptical okay uh, you uh, you just uh, do that one after so you'll be shown one image after another and thousands of people are classifying so you can show the same galaxy to multiple people so that you get a robust uh, classification so that was the galaxy zoo project as a sub component of that they did something interesting they said does the universe uh, is the universe truly anisotropic okay in terms of its rotation is there so do you find more clockwise rotating spiral galaxies in one direction and more anti clockwise rotating galaxies in the opposite direction can we test that so you show again thousands of spiral galaxy images to people and tell them that okay is it rotating clockwise or is it anti clockwise is it like this or is it are the spiral arms like that so you just click on one of the two so you can get within a days you will get statistics on tens of thousands of galaxies no 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 correlation with direction okay but i mean this needs to be verified right you, you can have any hypothesis but with citizen science you can test that hypothesis very quickly Yes. Voluntary, or? voluntary, voluntary, completely voluntary, and uh, the number of people uh, who are uh, part of these citizen science projects, the large ones, are in millions. And there are some people who do it like Saturday, Sunday, whole day. They will so they are ordinary citizens. They have their job. Amateur as not even amateur astronomer. These are some doctors and lawyers and some. some random combos of people who do it just for fun and with galaxies because you can show pretty images uh, it becomes uh, much more interesting i mean if you start showing people spectra and try to identify lines or some they will get bored uh, with that very soon but you show them pretty images of galaxies uh, they are doing it for they get addicted to that and they do it for hours like game or something like, like a game and there are many there was a discovery by a uh, school teacher from holland uh, of a, of something known as a vurwerp so you can go and look it up uh, what that is vurwerp v o o r w e r p it's called hanny's vurwerp okay so, so Uh, like uh, last time kishore they came to observe the ali he was saying that uh, they are using gatini ir which is having a, a very large uh, field of view in ir so uh, why is lsst like uh... it's not uv it's all optical and uh, near infrared yeah yeah y band so ug u is it's on the uh, it's still in the optical but on the uv side u g r i z y Are the six bands? Which one? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there is no comparison between yeah. the kind of sensitivity that you get with a bigger telescope. Yeah, but there are there are LSST is not the only synoptic survey project, and I have given you a view of the LSST as if it is going to be used for uh, studying galaxies, but it is going to be used to study asteroids, comets. Uh, other moving objects okay uh, even uh, stars huh? sorry so are they going to use yes yes in fact galaxies is not the primary science driver primary science driver is uh, near earth objects it's one of the primary science drivers then the properties of our galaxy okay uh, galaxy evolution is a side benefit 
exoplanets also stars in the stars we will characterize variable stars like never before because it's a synoptic survey it will observe <clears throat> the entire sky in 3 days and it'll again observe it then it'll again observe it it'll keep on doing this for 10 years so there will be a typically 1000 visits per uh, per uh, position in the sky times ha so the main driver is uh, is that the time series so you'll find supernovae for example you do a survey so whatever three days later you'll find many super so they are going to have event alerts which means every night uh, if you subscribe to it you'll get an email saying that okay this category of object uh, has been found possible nova possible supernova possible asteroid possible this so it'll classify it also because there are going to be 10 raised to 5 alert uh, events every night so you don't want uh, to get 10 raised to 5 emails so you'll have to subscribe uh, <laughs> so uh, can it also look for the uh, planets yes yes so so uh, these planet. dwarf planets kind of thing yeah planet x planet. whatever i mean something way beyond pluto something yeah, which yeah, we have yeah, not planet. found all that will be yeah 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 so all that will be there so that is the thing so lots of uh, indian astronomers have submitted projects and are now a part of the indian data rights uh, holder list and this is relevant for uh, ayuka and ncrs students because uh, this good representation from from us here uh sorry i'm ah, i'm the only one from ncr at the moment but we have uh, three pi positions so we could have more people joining so this is the thing uh, the sorry after vera ruby yeah so it was uh, renamed about 2 3 years back uh, as the vera rubin observatory yes that's ha ah, she's i told you na vera rubin is the scientist uh, who discovered uh, uh, who measured rotation curves of galaxies oh. and discovered dark matter <laughs> so she's one of the pioneering uh, astronomers and people thought she should have been given the nobel prize uh, but she didn't get and she died a few years ago and so they have now renamed in her honor they have renamed this yeah sorry uh i saw document by her so okay okay yeah yeah and so there is the rubin lsst website if you want and if you are in, in there are many science consortia that have been formed there is the dark energy science consortium stars galaxies there are about 10 uh, science consortia uh, galaxies is one of the big ones uh, they have their own website which is given here it's a lot of information for lsst also the data will be like is this like public or something no that is why we are uh, put in effort to join it like this so i'll tell you what will be public the alerts will be public so if something is suspected supernova going off because you want people to observe it with other telescopes right so anything that is a synoptic event uh, which is an alert that will go out immediately that you have access to you will also have access to the image itself so suppose the alert has gone off because a possible supernova has gone off in a galaxy that galaxy's image will be shared uh, with you immediately and not only the current image but all the past images of that part of the sky but not the full image uh, things and not the quads so what they will do is if, when you're studying galaxies if you want to reach this kind of uh, depth uh, that you see here you cannot do it in one 15 second observation but lsst is observing the same galaxy again and again and again so if you observe the same galaxy 500 times you can combine those 500 images and construct a very deep image 
So, so those deep images will not be released, uh, at least not immediately to the public, uh, non-participants. So that is why uh, people are trying to get join this collaboration. Uh, scientists in UK and uh, sorry, USA and Chile, every scientist in every institution will get access. But outside of that, uh, people have to apply. And uh, about two years back, they had an application process. So they said internationally, uh, people, you just apply with a project and you have to do something for them. So there is a in-kind contribution. Uh, so you propose what you can do to help the project. And so we had applications from India and several other countries. And about 800 applicants have been approved. Not from India, from international. From, from India are these people only, whatever list I put. And amongst these, you will see uh, names like PI, uh, names against whom there is PI. So those are uh, the named uh, PIs, but they can have their own postdocs and students uh, working on that. So that is listed as JA. So for example, uh, Preetish Mishra uh, is a JA because he's uh, uh, working with Surud uh, as the PI and he's the postdoc working on the project. So if someone has to take other he can uh, share the data with others? Right? Not uh, with everyone. So what they've done is every PI can have up to two postdocs or up to four PhD students. So you can share, huh? Six so, no, either two postdocs or four PhD students or combos. So you can have one postdoc and two PhD students. One postdoc is equivalent to two PhD students. So. so you can you can have any combo. It will not be given to project students. I think that will not be allowed, but PhD students are allowed access to the data. And you can also collaborate. So for example, if uh, uh, one of us, like Ayuka has no problems at all. They have five, five PIs, okay? So they can have any number of students. And if one person is, uh, one PI is full, Suppose he's taken, let us say Surud has taken four students. Okay. And uh, let us say Shomak has not taken any student. Then somebody can join and uh, say that Shomak, through Shomak, I'm getting access. That has nothing to do with the, your own PhD guide or anything. That can be different. So exciting times ahead. To 2014, 24 is when they will start the full survey. Uh, this for your batch may be too late in terms of doing something with LSST in your PhD. Uh, but for the next batch onwards, uh, it will be nicely timed. JWS is also LSST. Uh, they what they're going to do is what they've already released is. Uh, uh, something known as the uh, uh, simulated data, data preview zero, it's called. Uh, that is based on just uh, simulations. Uh, by middle or uh, end of next year, they will release the uh, single, what they call the single raft data. So nine CCD data. So the nine CCD camera will be installed now. It's being installed this year. And that will start do a survey. So we'll get a nine survey, uh, nine CCD data next year, by end of next year. And then uh, they will start with the full camera observations. Uh, they will do about six months of observations. And they will release that as the early data release. And that will be in 2024. And that already will be spectacular. I mean, it is just, it is going to be as better than the SDSS over 30,000 square degrees.
and eventually in 10 years it will be 100 times better so deeper than the sdss okay so with that uh, we've overshot today a little bit but that's okay uh, so that's the end of the course so i will not formally see you in this kind of setting but of course i will meet all of you over the coming years months and years so that's it so now only your assignment